Ihr Kollegs in partnership with the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Nephrologie, the Österreichische Gesellschaft für Nephrologie, and the Société Francophone de Nephrologie Dialyse Transplantation, Marcus at home welcomes Dr. Michael Linker in Cleveland, Ohio, with whom we would like to discuss the benefits of GLP-1 receptor agonists, particularly semaglutide, in non-diabetic patients with overweight or obesity who are at elevated cardiovascular risk, focusing upon the SELECT study that Dr. Linkoff presented at the last AHA meeting simultaneously with its publication in the New England Journal. Dear Dr. Linkoff, dear Mike, it's a pleasure and an honor to host you this European evening, American afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation. Well, thank you from my side. A few introductory words. Dr. Linkoff is an interventional cardiologist and professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. He's vice chairman for research at the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic, and his research activities, as alluded to, focus on the development of metabolic or antithrombotic therapies to prevent or reduce progression of atherosclerosis. Dr. Linkoff, we are very, very happy that you joined us, as we said, and we are very much looking forward to some um, overview of the study results from your side, and we would then discuss um, the select study and whatever goes beyond that maybe with you. Um, uh, this talk is moderated, as always, by uh, Gunnar Heine from Frankfurt. He is a new nephrologist with a keen interest in cardiovascular medicine, and Professor Kustodis in Saarbrücken as a cardiologist, interventional cardiologist also, and myself from Kaiserslautern in Germany. So uh, the screen is yours or the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Well, just to introduce the discussion, I can I can present some background to the meeting that we, uh, to what we presented at the, uh, the heart meeting. So this sort of provides uh, some of the perspective and background. Um, cardiovascular disease still remains the, the number one cause of death worldwide. Um, and uh, it's 32% of the global deaths have been attributed uh, in recent years to cardiovascular disease. The, the growing epidemic of overweight and obesity is quite striking. The World Obesity Federation projects that by the year 2035, over 50% of adults over age five, uh, of the population over age five will have overweight or obesity. And 4 million deaths in 2015 were attributed in an analysis to high BMI, with over two-thirds of those due to cardiovascular disease. So the linkage between cardiovascular disease and overweight and obesity uh, as a causative factor uh, is quite profound. It's uh, you know, fortuitous that the we actually uh, were able to present the results of the SELECT trial uh, at the same time as the announcement of the American Heart Association Presidential Advisory. Uh, in 2023, which speaks to the uh, the pathogenesis of, of, of cardio, cardiovascular, metabolic, uh, and, and kidney disease as a continuum or as a syndrome that, that bears attention and, and thought of as a holistic approach. Um, and one of the, the first mechanisms or the earliest mechanisms of this uh, is thought to be excess and dysfunctional uh, adipose tissue or overweight and obesity, leading to the metabolic derangements, which then lead to that subclinical and ultimately clinical cardiovascular uh, kidney or metabolic diseases. And so inter interfering with these processes, uh, intervening in, the, in this pathway uh, early on, uh, there's, there's, there's hope that we can diminish the downstream consequences of overweight and obesity. So th this initiative really recognizes the, the central role that overweight and obesity and, and dysfunctional body fat play in the development of a lot of the chronic diseases, uh, metabolic and cardiovascular. Here are multiple potential mechanisms by which overweight and obesity are linked with cardiovascular disease. We think of, of course, as shown on the right, the association between overweight and obesity and established risk factors. Uh, these include you know, di dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, uh, hypertension, uh, perhaps obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, but there's also substantial evidence that obesity and overweight in and of itself also contributes independently of these risk factors. And there have been studies that have shown that in so-called metabolically healthy uh, patients with overweight and obesity, that is, they do not have dyslipidemia or hyperglycemia or hypertension, they nevertheless have elevated risks of cardiovascular disease. And, and this likely relates to the 
uh, inflammatory and other uh, processes associated with visceral fat with dysfunctional body fat, ultimately leading to re reduced cardiometabolic fitness, low-grade systemic pro-inflammation, and then atherosclerosis, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. It is striking that although in uh, up until uh, the SELECT trial, uh, there has been uh, there have been attempts with randomized trials to show that reduction that agents aimed at or obesity management or, or overweight management could reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. In fact, no trial has been successful in doing that up until the present. Many of these trials were terminated for one uh, issue or another, subutramine because of increased, uh, uh, what appear to be increased cardiovascular risk, perhaps associated with sympathetic drive, Ramonabont because of adverse effects and suicidal ideation, uh, issues with naltrexone and bupropion re related to the conduct of trials, even the Camellia Timmy trial, which was successful in, in evaluating the cardiovascular safety of locasterin, was able to establish non inferiority, but showed no evidence of benefit in terms of actual reduction in cardiovascular events. The GLP 1 receptor agonists offer an opportunity to, to break this paradigm. Uh, and this is a these are uh, agents which uh, the there are multiple uh, potential receptors and, and uh, sites of action within, within the body. Uh, these are secreted from the ileum in, in response to meals, so the, the carbohydrate and fat load, and have effects on adipose tissue, muscle, of course, the pancreas with both alpha and, and beta cells, but, and also central activities in terms of satiety um, and, and uh, other, other related uh, processes. So the, this class of drugs ha has substantial progress, pro promise, event, initially, uh, it, it developed for the treatment of hyperglycemia in, in diabetes, but also shown to reduce body weight. In diabetes, in patients with diabetes, the, these agents reduce cardiovascular events. This was a, a recently published meta-analysis uh, uh, that showed that uh, overall, and, and particularly with um, uh, dulaglutide, with semaglutide, and with liraglutide, that there's actually a, a decrease in cardiovascular events associated with the use of these agents in, in, in the management of patients with type 2 diabetes. And there is substantial evidence that we could expect the same in the treatment of patients with overweight and obesity who do not have diabetes. Um, it's this, this, these are the outcomes for one of these, the weight management trials, the step one trial of semaglutide, the most potent of the GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, with substantial reductions in body weight, but also reductions in inflammation, uh, blood pressure, and other parameters that would be associated to, be associated to uh, lead to improved cardiovascular outcomes. So the question then, which was the motivation for the SELECT trial, was whether or not semaglutide, in this case, the, the GLP-1 receptor agonist that was evaluated, added to standard of care for cardiovascular disease in patients who have overweight or obesity, uh, but who do not have diabetes, whether that regimen would reduce the risk of cardiovascular events. So the trial uh, randomized patients who uh, had a body mass index of 27 kilograms per meter squared or greater, thus defining overweight or obesity, and had established cardiovascular disease, meaning that they had to have uh, a history of a prior myocardial infarction, prior stroke, or symptomatic peripheral vascular disease. They could not have diabetes. They couldn't carry the diagnosis. They did not. They could not have had a, a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 percent or greater at the time of screening, or be on glucose lowering agents. And they were over age 45. And they were randomized to receive uh, semaglutide at the 2.4 milligrams once weekly. That is the dose that is the weight management dose that's that's approved for that purpose or placebo, and then followed uh, in a uh, event-driven trial for the development of a total of 1,225 first MACE events, major adverse cardiovascular events. We enrolled 17,604 patients in, in 804 sites in 41 countries um, over the, for, the, for this trial. The, the primary endpoint was the triple cardiovascular endpoint, the hard cardiovascular endpoint of death from cardiovascular causes, non-fatal myocardial infarction or non-fatal stroke, in a time to first event analysis. And we had a number of secondary endpoints, but confirmatory secondary endpoints, that is those for which there was control for multiplicity, was death from cardiovascular causes, a heart failure composite, and then death from any cause. The patients, uh, the characteristics were well-balanced between the, the two groups of patients. 
Uh, 27% of the patients were women. A, uh, about a third of patients, uh, about two thirds of patients were, were had evidence had prediabetes as defined by a hemoglobin A1C between 5.7 and 6.4 percent, and 70 uh, percent of patients met body mass index criteria for obesity, that is over 30 kilograms per meter squared. In general, the patients were well controlled in terms of their baseline risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Uh, most were on antihypertensives, and their mean systolic blood pressure was 131 millimeters of mercury. Nearly 90% were on statins with a uh, LDL cholesterol at baseline of 78 milligrams per deciliter, uh, and so they were well treated. The average study drug exposure was 33 months in the semaglutide group, 35 months in the placebo group. That is slightly higher because of the slightly higher rate of study drug discontinuation in the semaglutide group. And the trial, the average follow-up was approximately 40 months. So the primary outcome of the study, that is the first occurrence of, of death from cardiovascular causes, non-fatal myocardial infarction, non-fatal stroke, uh, was uh, there were 701 events in the placebo group, 569 events in the semaglutide group for a hazard ratio of 0 0.80, that's a 20% risk reduction, and a two-sided p-value of less than 0.001 for superiority of semaglutide. The differences in the event rates began to emerge very early after initiation of treatment. You can see the divergence of the curves uh, very early uh, and was maintained throughout the, um, th throughout the study period. The effect, the efficacy of semaglutide was consistent, concordant across all of the pre-specified subgroups that were tested, uh, including the gender, uh, age, the body mass index at uh, at enrollment, so with a substantial effect uh, on patients who were even in the range of overweight, that is a BMI less than 30, as well as those who were, were higher BMIs, and the presence or absence of prediabetes. The first uh, of the hierarchically evaluated uh, confirmatory secondary endpoints was death from cardiovascular causes. For this, the hazard ratio was 0.85, but the upper limit of the confidence interval was uh, above one, and the two-sided p-value of 0 0.065 did not meet the pre-specified criteria that were required to continue the gatekeeping strategy, the hierarchical testing. So this was felt not to meet statistical significance, and all the subsequent uh, endpoints uh, were not tested for hypothesis testing. Uh, All-cause mortality, though, death from any cause, had a hazard ratio of 0.81, with an upper limit of the confidence interval of 0 0.93. The body weight, uh, on av for average, was about 97 kilograms for this population of patients and fell over the first 65 weeks uh, in the semaglutide group to uh, a, a relative reduction of about 9.4% compared to 0.9% for placebo. Waist circumference uh, diminished over the same time frame uh, with a, a placebo corrected difference of 6.5 centimeters favoring semaglutide. Adverse events, of course, are of great interest for this class of medication or the concern regarding uh, adverse events. Serious adverse events occurred less frequently with semaglutide than with placebo due to not only the lower rate of cardiovascular disorders, but interestingly, infections and infestations. So the infectious disorders were, were significantly less. Now, adverse ev events leading to study drug discontinuation were more frequent with semaglutide, 16.6 versus 8.2%. And this was driven almost entirely by the gastrointestinal side effects, nausea, diarrhea, and most of these were clustered in the in the dose escalation period. The dose escalation was uh, every every month, every four weeks, uh, there was an escalation uh, of the dose to reach the 2.4 milligrams. There were no increases in serious adverse events associated with gastrointestinal system, uh, nor other events of special interest such as adjudicated pancreatitis. There was a, a higher rate of gallbladder-related uh, adverse events, and those were cholelithiasis, uh, but no other serious adverse events or adverse events of special interest were more frequent among uh, patients who received semaglutide. So the, the if impressions or the summary for, from this study was that among patients who had pre-existing cardiovascular disease and overweight or obesity, but who didn't do not have diabetes, once weekly semaglutide at the 2.4 2 milligram dose reduced the risk of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or stroke by 
The benefit occurred early and was concordant across the subgroups and the various cardiovascular endpoints. There were no unexpected safety findings or greater risk of serious adverse events with semaglutide. And this then establishes semaglutide 2.4 milligrams as the first weight management therapy proven in a rigorous randomized controlled trial to reduce the risk of cardiovascular events. Now, of course, the big question is how? What was the mechanism of benefit or the mediators of benefit? Uh, and this is a, a, a speculative question. Uh, first of all, of course, the trial was not designed to look at mechanistically. It was a large scale trial. Um, and, and, uh, but nevertheless, we know that from the, the work that's done with this class of agents and, and with the GLP-1 receptor itself, that there are both the potential for indirect effects through other mediators or protect possibly direct cardiovascular effects. Indirects based upon the, the, the influence of GLP-1 on uh, naturesis, on blood pressure, of course, on body weight, inflammation, the uh, hyperglycemia itself, lipids, uh, potentially coagulation. Those can all, so can all be mediators through, through other intermediate risk factors. And there's also some evidence in various models of uh, direct effects of the GLP-1, both on the uh, the myocardium itself and on the vascular wall. So possible vascular protective wow. effects as well with, with reduction in atherosclerosis. It is relevant to go back to the primary endpoint and focus again on the idea uh, of the time course of the very early emergence of a difference in cardiovascular event rates while the peak body weight reduction uh, required 65 weeks to occur. So it, it it seems fair to to conclude or at least hypothesize that it is not strictly the magnitude of the weight loss uh, that is associated with the cardiovascular benefit. It may well be the processes that are occurring physiologically as patients lose weight with changes in visceral fat and, and ectopic fat and, and the changes in, in the dysfunctional fat cells that may occur very early on. But it, it doesn't necessarily seem to be dependent upon how much weight is lost for the cardiovascular benefit to occur. And then of course, there are the effects on the traditional risk factors, the intermediate risk factors that are, are associated and are, are influenced by this, this drug. Again, that part of that may be through the weight loss, but some of it seems to occur very early. There was a reduction in systolic blood pressure of 3.3 millimeters of mercury. For perspective, meta-analyses have suggested that drops in systolic blood pressure as little as two millimeters of mercury over time can be associated with redu reductions in vascular mortality. Uh, changes in lipids were, in general, particularly the cholesterol lipids, the, were uh, relatively minor, but there was a 15% reduction in triglycerides. And then, of course, there's the anti-inflammatory effect. This in a group of patients who were overwhelmingly receiving uh, statin therapy, the overwhelming majority, yet about a 37.8% reduction in high-sensitivity CRP by semaglutide, in addition to the, the effects of their baseline uh, cardiovascular medications. And importantly, although this group of patients could not have diabetes at the time of enrollment by the, by the exclusion criteria, uh, two-thirds of them did have pre-diabetes. Uh, again, it's defined as a hemoglobin A1C between 5.7 and 6.4%. And there were substantial improvements in glycemic control for those patients who were receiving semaglutide compared with placebo. In the semaglutide group, by week 104, uh, so approximately two thirds of those who started off with prediabetes had had a hemoglobin A1C that now uh, was below the threshold of uh, prediabetes. So they had a biochemical regression of their prediabetes as compared to uh, only 21% of patients in the, in the placebo group. And as I mentioned, there is some evidence uh, uh, that of a direct effect of GLP-1 receptor uh, agonism in this case with semaglutide in this animal model of a direct effect of on atherosclerosis reduction that seems to be at least a partly independent of body weight and this is uh, a study in in, patient, in uh, LDL receptor deficient mice where there were lower uh, plaque volumes and plaque lesion areas in the uh, animals that had been treated with semaglutide that was not uh, dependent upon the differences in body weight so I think the big conclusion from this is that we have we've had historically and evolved over time a number of 
uh, risk factors that we know not only promote or associate with increased risk of cardiovascular events, but that that are modifiable. That is, we have means that have been shown in in trials or with large large uh, databases that that reduce the risk associated with these risk factors, uh, the, the hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, as well as lifestyle related, tobacco, sedentary lifestyle, poor nutrition. And now obesity and overweight are established as again, a modifiable risk factor and that at, at least through the, through the weight management uh, the mechanism associated with GLP-1 receptor agonists. And for this example, we have at this point in time, one agent, semaglutide, which has demonstrated that benefit. So with that, I think I can stop uh, with the, the, the background from, from our study, and I welcomed a discussion and, and your uh, impressions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Linkov, and thank you for this great introduction and congratulations again for this landmark trial. I, I mean, this is marvelous. And you. you started off and introducing us to the holistic approach um, offered by the AHA for risk determination. And second, you offered a kind of holistic drug to us, um, targeting so many pathways and so many goals. You you showed us a subgroup analysis, and I, I think if that if I recall that right, the drug works in uh, obese and even in non so obese with the BMI less than thirty, as you showed us. Could could you speculate? Um, are those effects restricted to to obesity to obese, or could you could you speculate that? The, this drug or kind of approach would work off and work well in, in even um, non-obese? That's a very interesting question. I and, and a lot of, a number of people have brought that up. Is this necessarily anything? It does If you don't have diabetes and you don't have overweight at all, would there potentially be a benefit? And, and I think we're, we're left with, uh, you know, we don't know. Certainly, it inter this, this class of drugs and this drug in particular interfere with a number of the pathways that physiologically become important in patients with with overweight and obesity or dysglycemia associated with, with diabetes, which is somewhat of a continuum as, as the AHA advisory suggests. Whether or not patients who have other risk factors that are driving their atherosclerosis, be it lipid related or other, other genetic related or smoking, et cetera, whether or not those patients for whom the physiology, the predominant physiology of atherosclerosis development may be different, whether that would be as as susceptible to to uh, improvement with GLP ones, I think, are is is speculative, as I pointed out. Um, certainly, I think it's very fair to extrapolate from secondary prevention, where we actually study in this trial, to high risk primary prevention, because that's along a continuum of disease that we that we believe there's no reason to see a qualitative difference. Although absolute risk reduction may be lower in patients who are lower risk to start with. Um, but at least for now, I think until and unless you know, we have uh, other data emerge from other studies, that we should be focusing on the patient groups that do have the, the physiology associated with overweight obesity and, and dysglycemia. But the, when, going that same way, or the same direction, I th the most striking uh, figure from the paper, I think, is to your sub-analysis, because it doesn't really show any trend towards anything. As, as uh, Florian sort of pointed out, there's no difference really with the with the body weight. Same holds true for the pre-diabetes uh, status. I mean, first yeah. th I thought, well, two thirds is almost diabetic. It's really an anti-diabetic drug and diabetic, diabetes study. Um, but then you, you show very nicely that it works just the same way in those with an HbA1c below 5.7. Could you speculate a little more? You'd already did basically on the mechanisms. For, to, to me, two things appear striking. That's the CRP, which is only a marker. But what about the mechanism there? Do we have any thoughts on, on IL-6, on the inflammasome, on, on macrophage function, maybe from preclinical studies? So we are in the process of doing more detailed analyses for a number of these potential mechanisms to try to identify some of the mediators. But, and I say identify, but it, it at best is a hypothesis driving exercise. It, as we know formally, but also I think it's important to, to, to recognize 
in a real way that we it, that type of post randomization event that is a response that is how much weight they lost or how much their their uh, inflammatory markers went down or how much their blood pressure went down all of those are influenced by a lot of factors which can confound trying to sort out a drug effect so although we may get some some feeling or sense of what are the mechanisms that that are play important roles I don't think we're ever going to be able to really identify from a single study with the, you know what what the the predominant mechanisms are. So in, in terms of inflammation, you, what we have now in term for the data is the CRP. We we do have blood samples stored, and we're in the process of prioritizing what will be important studies to conduct in the future with what is obviously a very valuable resource. These blood samples, which are saved, and IL six is certainly one of the uh, one of the um, markers that we almost certainly will look at. Um, we are, and again, we are looking in more detail uh, of at the at the inflammation subsetting patients according to what their CRP levels, et cetera, et cetera were. It's it's notable to point out that the the mean CRP was only 1.8 in this population of patients. So uh, it, essentially half of them were below the median was 1.8. So essentially half of those patients were below what we would consider inflamed, um, you know, and and yet we didn't see a difference. But you know, based on um, the the early cuts on on those as well, so it's it, it's hard to it's hard to sort out. We we certainly think that not only systemic inflammation, but also the direct effects, even more locally, of ectopic fat, um, you know, uh, periadventitial fat pericardial fat, et cetera, that, that you know, has clearly been shown to be locally inflammatory and promote atheros atherosclerosis. That may be something that is happening that we may not necessarily see with systemic uh, measurements of, of, of inflammation. It, it's very interesting. Inflammation certainly seems to play a role in much of the effects of overweight and obesity on cardiovascular disease, but it's hard in, in one trial to sort out how much of the effect is mediated by that. May I ask you with regard to the safety profile, which was excellent, and you did a lot of work on that, even measuring calcitonin to rule out C cell changes. There was one point I would like to ask you. There was a slight increase in nervous system disorders. So was there any particularly kind of neurological disease that you found uh, to happen more often with the drug, or was this just kind of a mixture of everything? So we 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 are looking in much more detail at, at the breakdowns because one of the one of the issues of particular concern is suicidal ideation which some have thought you know may be associated with weight loss drugs or this class of drugs interestingly the FDA and a recent, some recent analyses have suggested that's not the case um but the the neurologic the sort of neurologic disorder in general uh, often involved just you know fatigue and and um, you know, loss of appetite and things like that. So it, it's a very mixed bag. And um, without going into details that we I don't have necessarily completely evaluated, and we are, you know we are planning to publish in, in the future, I can say that there weren't any clear trends in any kind of uh, distinct disorders uh, associated with semaglutide that were higher with semaglutide. Thinking about um, some some health policy issues, I think. Um... You, 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 you must have been asked all these questions about um, uh, um, Polish health policy and um, the possibility to 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 prescribe this kind of drugs to 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 every person who has an indication for that. Do you plan to follow up the cohort for? investigation of any legacy effects i mean there there, there must be people who, who who cannot afford the drug or who, who who will stop and and do you plan something like that yes um we actually have some of the sites are participating those who you know in in countries where regulatory allows us to do so um are, are in a follow-up in a passive follow-up registry follow-up of what we're calling select life where um, patients will be followed it's not the majority of the patients in the study for a variety of the logistical reasons but we will follow those patients on a on a passive basis after uh, randomization you know, after the study period which is, is is completed so and and it's very interesting that whether or not there will be a legacy effect as has been seen with some uh, treatments for diabetes of course in the past 
Um, and of course, that's the very important question is whether or not you can stop the drug and, and retain the benefit. We know from the studies that have been conducted, not only with this drug, but with others of this class, or even, for example, trisepatide, where, where there's been, uh, you know, there's a dual, dual agonist uh, act, effect that most patients regain mu much of their weight up to 70% or more over the time period after they stop the drug. Now, and this is the longest trial, uh, you know, 40 months of follow-up and, um, and 30, 30 high 30s of months of, of actual treatment on average, some patients, of course, much longer, whether or not the body is able to reset you know, its set point of, of weight, of you know, what it defends in the absence once the drug is discontinued, whether that will change, we don't know. Um, we, we went into this with the idea that this was like an antihypertensive or like a glycemic agent or a cholesterol agent that you know you 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 lose the at least the biochemical benefit um, once you stop the drug. Whether or not there's a persistence of the cardiovascular benefit, of course, will be very interesting. I think, although it's a clearly very important now in terms of availability of the drug, that as with any of these drugs in the early phases of their availability, the, the availability becomes better over time. You know, there, there'll be more competition, the drug supplies, the issues will be will be worked out. I mean, the, you know, both Nova Nordisk and, and Lilly for their drugs have worked very hard to increase capacity. Um, there are a number of other agents under development, either next generation, that is drugs that act on multiple receptors, such as trisepatide and, and uh, others, others by Nova Nordisk, et cetera, or small molecules that may be uh, more easily available, either orally or um, and less expensive. So I think what you know, as a field, we'll see over time, just as we have with a lot of other expensive drugs early in their in their life uh, management, their life cycle, is that there will be you know more availability. It doesn't diminish the importance of patients who need the drugs now. And I think what we should be doing now is focusing our national resources on those patients who are likely to have the greatest benefit. It's clearly attractive to use for patients for, for weight loss alone, but patients who have on the lower, on the, individuals who are on the lower end of the, the, the obesity overweight continuum and who do not have uh, cardiovascular disease, who do not have risk factors to place them at high risk for cardiovascular disease, that th those may be less of a priority, at least for the national resources to, to support um, the availability of the, these agents. So I think we should be focusing there, you know, there are a lot of patients who there is a, an important expectation of cardiovascular benefit, and that's, that's who we should be focusing our, our attention to. And, and, and hopefully reimbursement once regulatory approvals is, is, is documented for cardiovascular benefit, hopefully regulatory approval will lead to uh, some payer approval as well. I actually wanted to ask you one more mechanism question, but now that you alluded to the regulatory approval, is that what you're, do you have any insights into that? Is, is it, will, the, will there be an FDA approval for non-diabetics? There must be, or the, you're... So yeah, so it's in the public domain that, that Nova Nordisk has applied for the FDA for an expansion of the, the, the label indication for a reduction in cardiovascular events. So yeah. when that'll occur, you know, that typically I think probably over the next year, we hopefully will see it just as there was for diabetes. I think this, the, the evidence base for this is just as compelling as it is for in the setting of diabetes. So, and then to some extent that'll translate to, to payer willingness. I recognize this, that's a, you know, it's different in different countries. And obviously in the United States, we have, you know, our own idiosyncrasies, but, um, there are some, there is some payer willingness to, to cover uh, uh, GLP-1s in the setting of diabetes. It's still, and for many patients, the copays are very expensive and for others, many others, it's just not available, but hopefully there'll be some. But right now, almost uniformly, you know, Medicare and, and virtually all of the private payers do not cover drugs for weight loss. So what, what we've shown and what hopefully the regulatory agencies will agree with is that this is not in this setting a drug for weight loss, it's a drug for cardiovascular reduction in patients with overweight and obesity. Uh, let me ask you one more thing, uh, Flo and Gunnar, if you let me, about the, the mechanism. You pointed and you, you really focus on the early divergence of the, of the Kaplan-Meier curve. Um, what's your personal thoughts on the, on the, on the influence on thrombosis, thrombogenicity? You, you alluded to that in the mechanism uh, picture. Do, do we have any real data on that from, from the clinical side, maybe even because it 
seems like there's something in the very, very early weeks of the drug. And, and it, as you said, it cannot just be the LDL, the hypertension, because that would have, would, we, we would expect that to come into play later. Yeah. Well, we don't from this trial. Again, in the lar in a large scale multinational uh, mega trial, 17,000 patients, we weren't doing any type of detailed hemostatic, you know, hemostatic studies or any of the sub studies. Um, there, you know, so I, I can't say we, you know, there, 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 there are receptors, uh, you know, in hematopoietic cells and 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 on, on platelets that there's some evidence, at least in some uh, some species. So there, there potentially some effect both and an effect on endothelium and vascular health, which could lead to the, you know, to differences in thrombo thrombogenicity in in the vasculature as well. So theoretically, there's some evidence that there may be an effect. Um, we don't have any direct clinical evidence. You know, oftentimes we do. The, the mechanistic studies first to give us an, an enough of a um, encouragement to do the big clinical studies, but then often it's the reverse as well. You do the big clinical studies, you see a result, and then you you do more mechanistic studies to try to understand why. And hopefully, you know, this and uh, other studies of these clinic uh, that will show clinical benefit will lead to more elucidation of what some of these mechanisms are. Yes, I'm the only nephrologist here with three cardiologists. I surely have to point out that you also have had a pre-specified renal endpoint, which yes. was a four-point endpoint, so including a uh, halving of GFR and stage renal disease, renal death, and occurrence of macroalbuminuria. Um, mm -hmm. Here, again, you found a 20% decrease, and I'm positive that you will also have some additional analysis in the future yes. on a more strict renal endpoint. Uh, do you have any suggestions, any ideas how this may work when it comes to the kidney function? So, I mean, that's a very important question, not only because of the the uh, our, this trial, but of course, uh, as as is in the public domain, the flow trial, which is with semaglutide in patients with uh, chronic kidney disease, that was stopped early by the data data monitoring committee because of benefit. So, you know, we we are eagerly awaiting the the information that we get from that. Um, I, I some some have speculated it's, it's simply the the effects on naturesis. I, I suspect it's not. Uh, whether it's a vascular effect or membrane stabilization effect, um, or or the or an anti-inflammatory effect, or perhaps more likely the combination of all of those, um, I don't know. But uh, we are looking in great detail at the individual components of that endpoint. I can tell you that renal death didn't occur, so that part you know that that component is not is not wasn't we but again we we weren't this wasn't a population of patients pre-selected for kidney disease so it may well be very different when we see the results of the flow trial but um you know in terms of where the benefit was seen and the mechanism I, again as 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 frustrating as it is to to say the same thing it's it's i don't know it's it's speculative we know the effect where where the receptors are but we don't know how it's it's conferring this benefit baseline medication was excellent. The vast majority of patients, as you already mentioned, were on statins. There's one single exception. People were not allowed to be on anti-diabetic medication, so there were no SGLT2 inhibitors in the beginning. Yes. Uh, quite a few patients started these during the trial. Might this have affected the results? So, yeah, so you, you, you're absolutely correct. SGLT2s were not indicated at that time for indications other than diabetes when we started the trial. So it was considered a, a glycemic medication. Uh, and the patients, it was, a, as my recollection, about 12% or so ultimately, it, it may have been less actually, went, went on over the course of the trial for other indications. Um, so it, it might, but there's no reason to believe that the effects are overlap. The mechanism of effect of SGLT2 and GLP-1 are likely not overlapping. Now, renal effects might be, but at least the general cardiovascular uh, impression, the impression of the cardiovascular um, uh, physiology is that they're, they're probably complementary. So uh, other than perhaps reducing the baseline event rate somewhat, and again, and again with SGLT2, it's not primarily the ischemic cardiovascular events, but more those related to heart failure or the, the cardiac death, et cetera. Um, so I, I don't think a trial conducted in the future with with this class of drugs in which SGLT2 is used much more frequently would would uh, attenuate the, the the expected benefit perhaps in the renal world um, and and you you'd likely be more uh, more more uh, 
qualified to 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 say you know yourself with your with your expertise but i think that um I, I'm not concerned that this would be uh, attenuated or the, the benefit would be eliminated by concomitant SGLT2. Anyway, Flo will show us, as you again already alluded to, because I'm posted that here the vast majority of patients will be on SGLT2. Maybe one last speculation from my part on the mechanisms. Now, there's also some idea that GLP-1 receptor agonist may be kind of an anti-addiction drug, allowing patients who are smokers to stop smoking more easily even reducing alcohol intake. Uh, yeah. Did you by chance collect uh, smoking and alcohol intake during that uh, study? So will we have any information on that in how far this might also contribute? Yeah, we did not. And and I, you can you can look at that as something that we would perhaps do differently if we, we were designing it. Again, again, I have to fall back on the defense when you're doing a very large trial, doing the kind of surveys you know, 17,000 patients with multiple visits around the world becomes much more difficult. That doesn't change the fact that it would have been very interesting. But as you, as you almost certainly, as you're alluding to, there have been a lot of either sort of uh, reports in, in individual patients or, or studies such as those have shown what patients naturally do with their diets, that when they get on these drugs, they their shopping patterns change and they they buy much, much less in the way of sugar-rich foods and 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 fat-rich foods, and they without without prompting, and they they focus more on the, the protein-rich foods. So there's clearly some behavioral changes associated with this satiety center that that um, not only affect what they eat, but um, as you pointed out, less interest in alcohol and, and perhaps smoking reduction. So it's probably a common mechanism, but unfortunately, we did not we did not uh, take that opportunity to get that data from this trial. Maybe I um, may ask another question <laughs> referring to mechanism. I have to to maybe I, I can relate to 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 Stefan's question. I really like the figure with the early effect, the early divergence of the curves. What we know from from lay press and in the public domain is everybody's talking about obesity, and if you should make a ranking of mechanisms, isn't it that? waist circumference obesity comes second or third and first we treat bystanders inflammation coax and something but i don't know that those are mutually exclusive because the driver of inflammation is the ectopic dysfunctional fat and so i don't i don't think it's i mean i i'm fairly comfortable that it's not how much weight you lose although i think that certainly does contribute there's you know post hoc evidence from look ahead, the behavioral modification trial, that if you can lose 10% of your body weight or more, maybe then you have a benefit. So I, I certainly think that, that that adds to the benefit of substantial weight loss. Um, but I don't know that we can break it apart. The reduction of inflammation may well be the changes that are occurring early on physiologically with, with, with fat cells in, in negative, in this type of negative energy balance with this mechanism. So um yeah, you know, I think, and I, and I, again, I think the glycemic effect it may well be important. You know, we talk about prediabetes and diabetes as two different entities, but the reality is, of course, it's a continuum. Um, and, you know, there may be something about reaching a saturation threshold after uh, a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5% that really qualitatively changes your risk as well as quantitatively. But, you know, we did change glycemic control. Uh, most of the most of these patients do have at least prediabetes, so I think that's important as well. So, I, I I don't know, and I think they're so interlinked that it's not only a um, an inability to say it's one or the other, but they're so in, the, the the one so affects each other that that it's it, I think looking at it as a continuum is probably uh, the the physiologically correct um, approach. With all these di difficult mechanistic questions, um, we cardiologists often keep it keep it simple. And when the drugs first came out, GLP one agonists and and, and SGLT two inhibitors, I kind of summarized it in my head as SGLT two for for heart failure and GLP one for cardiovascular atherosclerotic disease. Now you showed very nicely, and we have some other data, Stephef and others, mm -hmm. that it's also an anti heart failure drug. Maybe do, yes. do you think it's it's it protects from heart failure? via a, a anti-atherosclerotic uh, or cardiovascular uh, effect, or is that totally separate? I think that it is a combination. So I, 
I think it's probably different from SGLT2, but I think for, for heart failure, and I, you know, I, there's certainly the effect of losing the weight, I think is a big part of it because much, you know, a huge part of the, the benefit more than in terms of magnitude than with SGLT2 or is it was the change in quality of life um, in, in their and patient's function with, and so um, with in the step HEFPEF trial, it will be very interesting to see the, the follow-on trial with diabetes that's, that's going to be reported, I think, in the next meeting. So, um, you know, much of it is, um, is patients feel so much better and are able to, to, to compensate, it, particularly with, with uh, preserved ejection fraction, and then the, the changes that, that are inflammatory, et cetera. So, you know, I think, is it cardiovascular? Probably less so. I don't, you know, uh, HEFPEF is probably less related to the ischemic disease than it is to the, all the other uh, processes that contribute to HEFPEF. Um, but I, I think it certainly is cardiac um, as well as, you know, general effects on, uh, holistically in the body when, when losing that, that much weight. So. And after all this, we really have to ask you for excuses for, for, for asking all the mechanistic questions that no one obviously can answer from, from this trial. And you pointed that out uh, yeah. very, very nicely. And um, one other issue, maybe to, 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 to end up uh, the discussion, you already mentioned terzepatite, um, and uh, you were an investigator in the ongoing cardiovascular outcome trial there as well. Um, the, what, what What's your thoughts there? Is will I mean we know about a stronger HbA1c reduction, stronger weight loss, will all even be more potent in, in reduction of cardiovascular events? On the speculation, I'm sure, but but speculation, but also very important. So we need that data. But you know, we we were able if we change fee, uh, 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 mechanisms and, and drugs and look at statins, for example, the cholesterol treatment trials collaboration was able to create their meta uh, regression analysis because they had different trials of different drugs that produced different amounts of LDL reduction. And then they were able to plot the, cardi the cardiovascular benefit or the clinical benefit versus that change in LDL reduction. So that's the way that you get over this that you, this uh, confounding um, that, that within any given, with any, in, within a single trial, if I were to look at you know who loses a lot of weight and who doesn't, um, and who has, do they, does that correlate with benefit? We're confounded by, well, what other factors uh, uh, account for those who lose weight and those who don't? So that that's the problem with post-randomization. But having multiple trials, particularly with different agents that produce different amount of effects on the biomarkers that you think may be linked to the benefit uh, is really uh, a very potent way of, of trying to get an idea what so those mediators are. So we hope, I think, and most of us anticipate that terzepatide will have a cardiovascular effect they don't yet have a outcome trial completed yet. Uh, I, I am involved in surpass CVOT, which is the outcome trial in patients with diabetes. Um, that's a you know very uh, um, a large trial and is also, uh, uh, they took on the challenging approach of actually comparing to an active compared to the dulaglutide as the, as the uh, control arm. So, you know, very uh, uh, ambitious project. And if that shows, you know, cardiovascular benefit, and, and particularly if it shows more cardiovascular be benefit than GLP-1, it will begin to provide evidence along this pathway of, you know, is more reduction in A1C, uh, better glycemic control, is more reduction in, in body weight, uh, potentially associated with more um, cardiovascular benefit. But we don't know that. And, and so, again, the information from that we can glean from select that we're having benefit before we lose as much weight as we're going to lose suggests that perhaps it isn't necessarily directly correlated, but I think we certainly all have the expectation that more potent drugs by mechanism, et cetera, will have more, will have more effect on the cardiovascular outcome. And then, you know, there's the, the combination of cagrolintide and, and semaglutide, which is being evaluated by um, Nova Nordisk in ongoing trials that also has an additive effect. That's an amylin um, uh, uh, receptor agonist that uh, it affects uh, satiety. And then, you know, Lily has retitrutide, which is a triple receptor uh, agonist. But, you know, so obviously I, the wonderful thing about findings that, of the trial like select is that it, it's it provides impetus and enthusiasm for you know really moving this field forward now and focusing on this this group of patients with you know drugs that are more potent and and, and potentially variations in in mechanisms so i think it's going to be very interesting i think we all have the expectation that terzepatide will will be a powerhouse as well with cardiovascular benefit but it does need to be proven and that's why in the slide i showed of the of the sort of you know pathways 
when you only have one drug yet in that in that group that's been shown the cardiovascular benefit, I think it's fair to say that that's all we know at this point in time. But I think most of our expectation is that Gisepatide will be very successful in this regard as well. Well, thank you, Dr. Linkoff. I think we come towards the end of the time for our talk. We could probably be discussing here for hours. We're fascinated uh, by your answers and, and the, the story. And uh, thank you so much again for the conduction of, of Select and for taking your time here with us and, and giving us so many insights uh, for us and everybody listens to the, to the video to learn even more. Um, we hope to see more in the future, of course, and, and again, looking uh, forward to it. And thank you for your research and your input. Thank you. I'm, I'm uh, very, uh, uh, we're very pleased with your interest and, and I appreciate you including me in this discussion. It's very, been very interesting for me as well.